My name is Francis Cowig, and I am the playwright for Snow in Midsummer. Uh, my name is Justin Oliver, and I'm the director for Snow in Midsummer. Um, Justin and I started working together through the RSC because the RSC had commissioned me to do an adaptation of Snow in Midsummer, which is based on the classical Yuan Chinese play, The Injustice of the Injustice to Doi. The Injustice to Doi, which, which moves heaven and earth. Which moves heaven and earth. And so uh, Justin had worked at the RSC before, and so they, they thought really believed in his ability to kind of helm, helm this show. And so that's we first met over the internet. Yeah, we did. It was a, a Skype conversation mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, and I'd expressed an interest in the, the RSC at the time were running a project which involved translating Shakespeare's plays into Mandarin and adapting Chinese um, classic stories onto uh, into, for, into English. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, because of that, they had commissioned Francis, um, as she just explained. And then I got involved um, as a director because I think I'd expressed this interest in that whole kind of canon. Because I suppose as an artist, one of the things I'm really interested in is stories that we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of a thing that really motivates me. We had a summer workshop that was very hands-on, improving a lot of scenarios with this amazing British East Asian acting company. And so um, Justin was, he definitely helped generate a lot of the plot during that summer workshop. Uh, I would say that Francis um, would take the kind of uh, work we'd done in the daytime with the actors and, I mean, quick as you like, she'd write scenes and the next day they'd come in and we'd try them out and we'd adjust them a little bit and the actors would say, no, what about this? or what about that? And Francis would go away and write. And actually, all through the original rehearsal process, up until like two weeks before we opened, Francis was still rewriting and tinkering with scenes, weren't you? And I think up until two days before well, but we two, opened. Two, two, we days, two days before we were, yeah, yeah. But I mean, big, big, big things yeah. and new scenes. And yeah, 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 we, yeah we were yeah. still, yeah, we did. I mean, all through previews, we reordered the structure of stuff mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I think that was. That was one of the most enjoyable parts of the Absolutely. of the whole thing. Actually, was you know we both were really keen to try and just keep pushing this story, um, uh, and I think that's one of the things that we're excited about getting another chance to do mm -hmm. it because there are still a couple of things that we might want to change or adapt or grow, and I mean that's really exciting to be here in this with. Um, particularly with a company of actors that are used to working in that way as well mm -hmm. and that want to change things. I think that's really exciting. Totally. I had read it before I knew that Francis was writing it, yes. Mm -hmm. So I had read it. Um, I have since watched the, uh, there's a couple of versions of it on uh, Chinese opera versions of it mm. on video. Um, yes, uh, I mean, then the, the very form of Chinese opera is so different to kind yeah. of theatre and it's not dramatic in the way that we, I mean, it's all about the singing and the music and the costumes. Uh, whereas I think the thing that France has done so brilliantly, um, she's written a, like a completely contemporary story. Mm -hmm. um, she's taken this epic mythic play and just made it completely sing for today, you know, and that's really exciting. The way that people experienced theater um, back then during the Yuan Dynasty was more similar to how we experience a baseball game now because the audience had total freedom to talk eat, nap, come and go as they pleased. It was a much more relaxed and frankly probably more enjoyable than today theater experience. And so for that reason, um, the way that you told the story was completely different. In the original play, you hear the same plot probably four different times just in case you fell asleep. And so if, if a, a, a current audience kind of experienced that play, I don't think they would very, really know how to understand or appreciate it because now we're very kind of fascist with our audience experience and so I had to kind of rewrite to you know our current kind of ADD um, audience attention span. So both plays are about um, a young widow who is framed and executed for a crime she didn't commit and her angry ghost causes a three-year drought um, and the contemporary adaptation uh, is set during Ghost Month, which is a Buddhist holiday in um, July or August of every year. And during Ghost Month, the idea is that the gates of the underworld open and ghosts are free to visit as, as they please. And the kind of the, the barrier between the world of the living and the world of the dead um, thins and, you know, disappears. And so 
into this, and there's so many superstitions about Ghost Month that kind of create the rules of the world of snow in midsummer. So things like you're not supposed to cut your fingernails during Ghost Month because it's an invitation for spirits to visit. You're not supposed to get married during Ghost Month. You're not supposed to move. And so in the contemporary adaptation, we use a lot of these superstitions as kind of rules of the world. So in the very first scene, um, there's a marriage proposal. There's people mo kind of moving, though not permanently, to a town for a short while. And there's a lot of um, things that you're not supposed to do during ghost months that happen. And that is why a ghost is able to enter the world. And so in the play, we, we, we enter the play um, first by meeting the character of Do Yi. Um, it's, it's a prologue. So we see her um, three years earlier when she's selling um, weavings on the street. And then when we see her being you know, taken away, or we see her, so, something bad happens, but we don't know what. And then, the, and then the, for the remainder of the play, we're in the present moment in which a, a wealthy female entrepreneur has just arrived to this drought forsaken town to buy ailing factories. And her younger daughter, Fei Fei, who um, is a very uh, devout believer of all these superstitions, begins to be kind of haunted and tormented by a ghost, and that kind of haunting is what starts to drive the contemporary action. In terms of uh, the relationship between Snow and Midsummer, Francis' version, and the original story, obviously the, a key thing we've kept is the way that women are treated in society, and that is a focus. Now, Francis looks at it through a 21st century lens, but nonetheless, like that whole relationship with you know, who holds power, who uses power, and who, who abuses power holds really true in Francis's version. Um, I think the other, uh, the other brilliant thing that Francis has done is she's got this metaphor running through it about a missing heart uh, and the various ways in which we as humans can miss our hearts, uh, both literally, metaphorically, and spiritually. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really... It's just an amazing theatrical idea that, you know, I think is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, as soon as I um, just decided to set the story in contemporary China, a lot of the themes just emerged organically by just kind of examining what the givens would be if you just updated the story of a woman executed for a crime she didn't commit to the present to present day China. So things like until three years ago in China, it was um, totally okay for uh, executed prisoners to have their organs harvested without their consent and sold to you know the highest bidder around the world. And so I played with that. Um, or you use that to the idea of this girl who's executed, her organs are harvested um, without her permission and sold to wealthy people around Asia. Um, and I really am interested in kind of the making visible, the invisible relationships in global capitalism, um, the relationships between kind of poor people within China and wealthy consumers all over the world. And so um, Do Yi is, you know, very literally looking for her pieces of her mutilated body that have been taken without her consent and spread around the world. I think one of the things that surprised me the most about the original mm -hmm was that so many people said to me that they had dreams about it afterwards. Ooh. Which really, yeah, yeah that, and I did. I had dream, I had quite a few dreams, but that really surprised me. I mean, when you're dealing with a play that looks at the spiritual and what the spiritual means in today's world, mm -hmm. it fascinated me that it permeated people's subconsciouses or mm. unconsciouses in that kind of way. I thought that was really interesting. Nice. One of the things that I think Francis captures brilliantly in the play is um, the, just the speed of change in China. Um, and that, I think, subverts people's expectations of China in a really exciting way. And actually, in loads of ways, it's hyper-modern and it's kind of super capitalist and super industrialist. I mean, I, um, you know, uh, China, the Chinese make an awful lot of the world. I mean, it's the, I'd say it's the workshop of the world, really. And um, so even though essentially New Harmony is a village, it's a village that's powered by this enormous economic growth. And with that, you know, the minute you start doing that, you then have, you know, bars and, you know, restaurants and, you know, all sorts of, you know, 
are those kind of other aspects of modernity and seeing signs of consumption, you know, capitalist consumption. Um, and it felt really important that the play do that. But at the same time, the very nature of the story is we're in a drought. So it's what do those things look like in a society that's been ravaged by a drought for three years where mm. maybe you're arguing the natural world is fighting back at you or, you know, maybe you're going, maybe the point you're making is, well, you can't defy the natural world. It will always, you know, and I think that's the thing that we're really kind of, uh, that feels very integral to the physical actualization of the play, really that sense of what happens when you plonk a lot of today, a lot of modernity into, you know, something... Uh, into the natural world, you know, that has obviously its own laws and its own rules, um, and that clash feels very important. Mm. I've lived in um, East Asia from ages 9 to 18 and have gone... My mother's from Taiwan, and my father um, was a U.S. diplomat, and so I lived in Beijing from um, 96 to 2001, which was the kind of a massive period of transformation in China, um, specifically in Beijing and, you know, just witnessing the kind of surrealist things that would happen on a daily basis, for example, especially when they were trying to get the Olympic bid. You know, they would seed the clouds to make it rain so it would be a blue sky day for the Olympic committee. They would um, put spray, there was all these dead trees outside my diplomatic compound, so they spray painted them green before the, <laughs> you know, Olympic committee came through. They put up all these plastic palm trees and illuminated them with neon green light. And so this, you know, just playing the, the givens again of the kind of surrealist things that are just done to kind of create this sense of beauty and it's so um you know china has such a rich history of kind of hiding what's going on with theater for example during the cultural revolution and the great famine when all these you know people were literally starving to death you know they would you know suddenly plant all this you know fake grass when chairman mao was coming through the village where everyone's starving to just you know make make believe that everything's going okay you know so we'd kind of play with a lot of um the things that are in kind of the literal reality of um current contemporary China and, and, and also their past and how they engage with the weather and natural and man-made disasters and try to cover up. I think one of the things uh, that's so compelling about the story is the pace at which Snow Midsummer unfolds. Um, what we wanted to do in creating the show is kind of have the audience on the edge of their seat all the time, not ready for the next twist, not ready for the next turn. And, um, I, I, you know... I, I think that what France has done so brilliantly is not only does it have that momentum, but it emotionally keeps on hitting you towards the end of the play over and over again. Um, and it's a fantastic experience being in the audience, ha having that. You have both, I uh, hope, a visual feast, but I kind of hope you have an emotional punch in the guts as well. And all through the lens of a kind of mystery thriller whodunit structure. So hopefully it stays engaging and interesting and there are clues throughout that keep you kind of focused and interested in the story.